The Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International presents this luncheon lecture. Today's topic, the Center's Approach to Relieving Arthritis. Your presenters, Dr. Ron Huntinghockey, Dr. Rebecca Kirby, and Dr. Chad Creer. Well, I'm Dr. Ron Huntinghockey, and I would like to welcome all of you here on behalf of the Center. And as you know, our lecture today is entitled, The Center's Approach to Arthritis. But uh, in honor of our our chief, who I, I guess most of you know that Dr. Reardon passed away about a month ago, and we decided that we wanted to rename these, but the brochures were already out, and so we'll be talking about the Reardon approach to arthritis. And so I wanted to give just a little bit of, of an introduction today as to what that is. Um, and then most of the time, we will be spending allowing you to ask us questions. What the, the handout that you have is really a very comprehensive look at our laboratory protocol for arthritis and then some of the treatment modalities that we use here at the center. And uh, the comment that we always get from our lectures is there wasn't enough time to ask questions. And so today you will have a good probably 40 minutes to, to ask questions. Uh, Dr. Reardon really valued the, the doctor-patient relationship. He felt that was a cornerstone to a successful result. Here at the center, we encourage our patients to become co-learners. The difference between a patient and a co-learner is that a co-learner is more actively involved in the discovery of the underlying causes of their illness. <clears throat> We're all doctors here. Uh, uh, Dr. Kirby is a family physician and a registered dietitian. Dr. Chad Career is both a naturopath and a chiropractor. Dr. Jim Jackson is in the back of the room and he's a PhD. Uh, he's our, the head of our lab. So we have, and I'm a family physician. So we have, we have the doctor training, but part of what's different about the center is that we like to act more in the role of a teacher or a guide. And so that's where we came up with the the preceptor co-learner relationship. A preceptor is someone that guides you in your learning experience, like a teacher. Uh, and so Dr. Reardon wanted people to become more involved in this process of finding out why they were having a chronic or persisting illness that other people could not find the reason for. And so that leads to the second precept which is identify the causes. And if you look on the back of this front page, there's a rather interesting looking diagram. And you'll see that identify the causes is an acronym. And these are the categories that we think about as we're going through the uh, intake, history and physical, and the evaluation of the patient. We're looking for infectious causes, digestive problems, emotional issues, nutrient deficiencies, inflammation. You can kind of look through this whole list. But this is a way of thinking about true underlying causes that very often do not uh, get addressed. Uh, a lot of modern medicine has to do with making the diagnosis and using the treatment to treat the symptoms. And not enough attention is paid to looking at all the various underlying causes, which can be sometimes very fairly hard to, to tease out. The, this is what we'll be attempting to do with our new patients and inviting them to be part of this discovery process and looking for the underlying causes of their illness. Now to do that, which leads us to the next precept, characterize the biochemical individuality. Dr. Reardon believes strongly that the lab was a very important tool in helping us verify our, our hypotheses. If you come in and we think, hey, do you have uh, a vitamin C deficiency? Well, we could talk about it for a long time, but if we send you to the lab and we can actually measure it and find out whether you do, that gives us very strong indication of what actions need to be taken to, to correct that particular cause. And so the arthritis sheet that you have, this is like this, this is the first page of, uh, that's a white sheet is really a uh, replica of our lab order sheet. And so these are the tests that we would think about in someone who had arthritis. Not necessarily all the tests, but based upon 
scientific studies that have shown underlying causes of arthritis, chronic arthritis, these would be tests that we would do on an arthritis patient. Then the, the next thing is treat the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. And so we, we tend to use uh, treatments that correct the underlying causes. We're trying to use naturalistic or nutritional, herbal, homeopathic, um, things that kind of help actually correct the deficiency or remove the toxic factor from your, from your constitution. So these arthritis therapies are therapies that have been tested, but they may not apply to you. And this is where the lab is so important in helping us see whether or not you even need to bother about any one of these particular therapies. But they at least today will give you a panoramic view of what is available from the natural realm to help out with chronic arthritis. The next precept, let food be thy medicine, very often we forget that food is the fundamental uh, factor that underlies almost all chronic illnesses. Very often people are not either they're not eating what they should be eating or they're not absorbing what they're eating or they may be having toxic reactions to certain foods. For example, you may not know that you are sensitive to gluten. You may not have full-blown celiac disease, but you may have a partial gluten sensitivity and this can actually cause inflammation in the lining of your intestine, which can make it more leaky, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and that can let antigens in which can form antibody complexes that can get stuck in your joints causing an inflammatory response and causing arthritis. More often than not, we'll do the cytotoxic tests on our patients and they'll eliminate, let's say, tomatoes, uh, a nightshade food, just as a for instance, if, there's, if that's what shows up in their test. And within a period of time, they'll notice a marked reduction in their inflammatory symptoms, just as, a, as an example of let food be thy medicine. It can be a good foods, you want to eat more of the good foods, but you also want to eliminate foods that may be causing reactions in your body. <clears throat> Dr. Reardon was very fond of the concept of reserves. That in any system, whether you're talking about a business or uh, you're talking about uh, the way the heart functions, you know, like, or the lungs, most of our organs have, tr have tremendous reserves, but as we get ill, and older, we tend to use up those reserves, and as the reserves are used up, that's when illness starts to occur. In a business, when you use up your, your reserves, then you're at greater risk whenever a downturn occurs in the economy. So one of the healthy things that we like to encourage people to do is to assess their reserves and then try to build adequate reserves of, of nutrients. Uh, it can be nutrients, it can also be like relationships. You wanna have a good, uh, system, family support system, or friends, these can, these can be reserves to you as well. And then finally, the healing power of nature. Uh, in this day and age where there, are, I was just talking to a patient this morning, uh, she was concerned about the medicine that she was taking. Medicine does have its place. We do need medications, uh, but there is a lot of concerns about medicine. And part of what we're here to do is to look for the underlying cause to see if we can correct that so that medication might not be necessary. Sometimes it is necessary. Uh, but if we can let nature actually correct the underlying problem, actually promote a healing process, that in our thinking here at the center is a, is a better way to go. Uh, sometimes, like I said, you have to use uh, the best of both worlds. But nature is the ultimate healer. There's an old saying, uh, medicus so not naturis curat. The physician treats, but nature heals. Uh, uh, Dr. Creer was telling us last week, did, you, did any of you know what the word physician means? Nature. Is that right? It's a Greek word that comes from, it means nature. So the true physician is the natural ability to heal. And so w what we're trying to do here at the center is facilitate a healing process. And we want to get you involved in it more so than maybe you've been in the past. And that's part of why I think you're here. The, the people that uh, are attracted to this approach are people that are probably more interested in becoming involved and finding out what they need to do in order to promote uh, a healing uh, process in their lives. And in, in, and in today, we're, we're talking specifically about arthritis. 
Okay, I'm going to have Jan hold up the microphone there, and and if you if you have a specific question, um, uh, raise your hand. I, I'm going to. Do you guys have any like any opening comments that you want to make uh, about inflammation? Very good, Ron. Very good. Thank you. I will put in a little plug here. Uh, about two weeks ago, I had a book uh, accepted for publication entitled "Inflammation, Arthritis." And aging, and so uh, having spent a lot more time on it than I thought I was going to, and, it, and I have a lot more respect for authors than I ever did, uh, <clears throat> I do have that as a kind of reference, at least in my thinking, and that will be out in about six or seven weeks, and it'll be available upstairs. So uh, there are, uh, there is another book upstairs entitled *The Inflammation Syndrome*, written by Jack Chalam. Uh, I, read, I wrote the preface for that, and that's how I got hoodwinked into doing the, the other book on, on inflammation. So that is a, a resource that we have available uh, that will be coming down the pipe and that I can refer to in answering your questions. So does anyone have any basic questions that they would like to ask at this point? Yes, ma'am. She's going to bring the microphone down here. Oh, here she is. Okay. Uh, my question regards fish oil. I see that you do recommend the use of it, but I also understand it is a blood thinner, and so you need to go off before you have some surgery. How far in advance of surgery, if you know it's scheduled, should you go off the, the fish oils? How much are you taking? About 2,000 a day. Yeah, 2,000 a day shouldn't be that. I mean, that's that's about eating uh, a good serving or two of fish. And so uh, very seldom do the doctors say, don't eat fish the day before surgery. So I would say a day or two probably would be, be good enough. Now, we're, we're using fish oil in much higher levels. Uh, we're finding out how many of you have been reading that inflammation is an underlying cause of a lot of chronic illnesses, heart disease, Alzheimer's, even osteoporosis, and certainly arthritis. Uh, and one of the things, as people are concerned about what medications are available and are there any alternatives, I would sure like to let you know that fish oil is a very good alternative. And the problem that most people have had in the past is that they, they don't like the fish oil burp. How many have experienced the fish oil burp? Well. Uh, there's a whole new generation of pharmaceutical grade fish oil capsules and oils that are now available that have been uh, molecularly distilled. There's no mercury in them. There's no PCBs or, or pesticides. And they have gone to great lengths to not allow any rancidity to occur, which is what tends to make fish fishy. And so uh, the American Heart Association has also come out now in favor of fish oil supplements as a protective measure against heart disease. As a matter of fact, the New England Journal of Medicine last year published an article where they did a meta-analysis showing that of all the things that you can do to prevent heart disease, fish oil uh, supplementation appears to be the most effective. So for those of you that are wanting to use something as an alternative for inflammation, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, using fish oil supplements. And certainly if you measure your levels, it, uh, it can help you determine how much you need. How about, how about hemp seed? It has the right proportion of omega-6 and omega-3. Uh, I find it's a little bit expensive, but uh, I'm having problems and I started on it and it's, I believe it's helping me. Yeah. Well, uh, the hemp is mainly the alpha linolenic acid, which is one of the omega-3 fatty acids, but it's the EPA and DHA that are in the fish oils that have uh, the most benefit in competing with some of the more inflammatory omega-6 fatty acids. And it's the EPA and the DHA that go on to form the prostaglandins that help to fight inflammation. Um, and, and so when we look at fatty acids, it's beneficial to have a, an appropriate ratio of the omega-6 and the omega-3 fatty acids because we do need both. Um, and oddly enough, one of the omega-6 fatty acids has also been very beneficial uh, with inflammation 
in arthritis, and that's the GLA, which you find in evening primrose oil and borage oil and uh, black seed currant oil. Any, uh, any extra thoughts on that? The, the other idea on that is uh, there's an enzyme called delta-6 desaturase, which you don't have to remember, but it is necessary for the conversion of what's in flax oil and hemp oil into EPA. And this enzyme requires a number of cofactors. Remember that nutrients always work as a team. And so if you are using flax oil, you may need to make sure you have adequate amounts of magnesium, vitamin B3, there's a vitamin B6, I think zinc is in there, but there's a number of cofactors that you, you need to make that work properly. So always think in terms of nutrients as a team. So if, if you're taking a source of alpha linolenic acid, which is one of the omega-3s, uh, it's not that you have to you know, throw out your flax. Uh, what may be beneficial is to add the fish oils. Okay, thanks. I would like to know if there have been studies that show that particular foods are the most common to cause us a problem, or and are there a group that are least likely for the general populace, of course? Well, a, a lot of the reports on, on food sensitivities, the common ones that show up are, are milk, peanuts, corn, and soy, and a lot of the times rice, now that that's more of a popular staple, and then wheat. Those seem to be the ones that, that, that give people the most problems and then that, that can trigger the immune responses for one reason or the other. Uh, some of the safer foods, I would say now, are, are you know lamb as far as a meat substitute and as far as... <laughs> Uh, you know, all of your vegetables and a lot of your fruits, um, those don't show up quite as often as some of, the, as some of the grain products and some of the protein products. So, you know, vegetables, fruits, um, lamb, chicken, those don't tend to show up quite as often. Uh, you have any? And one caveat on that is the nightshades. How many of you have heard of the nightshades? Dr. Jackson has. Uh, the, the, the tomatoes, uh, potatoes, green pepper, oregano, uh, eggplant. eggplant, and tobacco. Uh, they are all uh, contain alkaloids, which for some, not everyone, but for a fairly large number of people, it can trigger arthritis type symptoms. And so if you wanted to uh, do a trial basis of eliminating one group of foods, try eliminating the nightshade. If you're having osteoarthritis, it's a, it's a common cause for osteoarthritis. But the best way is to actually get tested, and the cytotoxic test is a very simple blood test that you, you just need a 12-hour fast. Uh, you take the blood, and then the blood is, uh, is mixed with uh, 90 different food antigens, and it's allowed to incubate. And then it's, we look at each slide under the microscope and score the amount of tox toxicity that that particular food has in your system. Uh, for example, uh, this, this, this individual uh, has allowed us to use her name, Marge Page. Marge Page is, is the, the uh, no, Dome One was named after her. She came to us with rheumatoid arthritis and was so debilitated she could no longer golf, she could no longer play the organ. Uh, we determined two very important sensitive foods for her. One was corn and the other one was, I think it was shrimp or some kind of seafood. And, and it would be such that if she would even have a little bit of shrimp sauce, uh, the next day she could barely get out of bed. But by eliminating those two completely from her food program, she, w she is now, for the last actually 15 years or so, she's been back playing the organ and, and golfing and being a very active person. And so uh, by identifying sensitive foods, that can make a huge difference. In my book, that's my pathway number five for helping people uh, get to the root of what's uh, causing their arthritis is, is identifying foods. I, had a, I can think of another patient who was a janitor. And what do you think, he's a janitor, what do you think his food was that was so debilitating to him? 
uh, coffee. He was he didn't realize it, but he was drinking coffee all day long. And once he was able to eliminate, uh, identify it, eliminate it, he he showed a progressive improvement in his functionality score. And just as a test, about a month later, he had one cup of coffee, and and his, his score jumped way up in terms of the amount of inflammation and pain that he was experiencing. So very often when you eliminate a food, you won't see a result in a day or two, but it's over a month or six weeks that you'll notice that things are better. And then when you re-challenge with that food, very often you'll notice that, hey, this, this really was the trigger food and I just, didn't, I just didn't realize it. Partly because the body adapts, tries to adapt to the sensitive foods. Uh, when you eat a food that you're sensitive to, your body will put out a little bit of extra cortisol, a little extra adrenaline, some endorphins, and you'll actually feel good. As a matter of fact, there's a saying that if you want to identify your, your sensitive foods, take the top 10 foods that you don't think you can live without and that you have to have every day. Uh, and and, and not, all, not all the time, but often uh, maybe half of those foods you will be sensitive to. And, and if you by chance uh, eliminate them for a while, you'll notice that you feel significantly better. I'm on a medication that about 30% of the people on it can develop stiff muscle stiffness, joint aches, and I seem to be that person. <laughs> and with these, um, like fish oil and changing, watching the diet and these things be helpful, or is the medicine just going to cause it? Are you talking about like a statin medication? or? No, it's uh, Remedex. Um, it's the newer one from Tamoxifen. Um. Certainly, you know, if, 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 if you have to be on a medication, then yeah, you, you might want to try other nutrients to try to help compensate. The reason people have side effects from medicines is that medications are designed to block certain pathways. And, and it's for a benefit. You block the pathway for a benefit. In, in your case, it's for a definite benefit. But because those pathways are blocked, uh, then certain side effects will occur. Sometimes, not always, you can use nutrients to compensate for that, and uh, and and certainly, you know, you can try nutrients. Uh, part of the reason we, we are here at the center is that we found that when people test nutrients, they have a better idea of which ones to focus on. You do not have to become a patient here at the center to to do nutrient testing. We have a program called beat the odds where you can uh, come in anytime and have various panels uh, done to help you uh, assess the adequacy of your nutrients. Twice a year we have a beat the odds days uh, that where we, we do a, a, a big discount to kind of help facilitate people getting these levels measured and that's coming up here uh, the end of March, 1st of April. And so uh, I would encourage you to, to you know, uh, look at this list here and, and maybe do some testing to see if you can find some areas that would help you out. So I talked to you. Okay, I'm, okay, go ahead. Since you're uh, test that you were talking about. Um, it, will that show up foods right away that if you're allergic to them or are causing... Uh, arthritic pains and things? The term we use uh, is adverse food reactions. Uh, it's different than a food allergy. A food allergy in, in conventional thinking is you eat a, a peanut and your throat starts to swell shut or, uh, or you don't, it's not like not chewing your food. Are you okay? Good. And I'd like to thank the doctor that went to her rescue. Thank you so much. Um, but an, uh, a food allergy tends to be immediate and either hives or an anaphylactic type reaction where your throat tends to close up. Whereas an adverse food reaction, can, it can happen over the course of minutes or hours or sometimes even days. I'll tell people, you know, you might eat the, the allergic food and it's the next morning that you wake up really stiff. So the adverse food reaction is what we pick up with the cytotoxic test, not necessarily the food allergies. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. When you spoke about um, coffee being a trigger, is it the caffeine in the coffee or the acid in the coffee that tends to be the trigger? 
I mean, would drinking decaf have the same effect as... Okay. Dr. Jackson, who is in charge of our lab, we measure the caffeine for the coffee particular test. But sometimes it's the whole food, because we've had instances where people do not react to white flour, but they'll react to whole wheat, for instance. So sometimes it's how the whole food affects your system. And so food reactions are very individualized. So when we talk about coffee, I'm not making a global statement, because there's a lot of people that drink coffee and their joints are fine. But we find that there are these individualized reactions that people have that, you know, we don't know why one person develops a sensitivity to one thing and the other person doesn't. It's a... Individuality. Yeah, biochemical individuality. I've known since I was a kid that I just didn't like onions. My parents would put onions on hamburgers and our friends would eat onion rings, and for some reason I just didn't like them. I came here and found out that I was too plus sensitive on the cytotoxic test, and if I eat the onions, it acts like a knockout pill to me. And so what you find with the cytotoxic very often is that there are foods that you may at one time or another thought you were reactive to, but you just kept on eating them anyway, and they kind of go underground. You don't realize they're affecting you so much. And then what the test does is it reveals to you what that food is or what several foods are, and as you eliminate it from your diet, you notice that things start to work better. The pains or the aches or whatever the symptom is you're having with that food tends to clear up. So it's one of the things that we do that people notice the clearest cut improvement from fairly quickly. You know, it's usually within a matter of weeks being off the offending food that they notice that they are functioning better. So that is an important thing that you tend not to have available to you in a regular office setting. Oh, yes, here's back here. Yes, ma'am. Does your regular health insurance cover these tests? Some do and some don't, and it just depends on the insurance coverage. Once you've had those tests, do those tests pretty much remain the same, or do they need to be rerun? Some years back I had mine done, but it was like, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I found that about 70 to 80 percent of them stay the same. There's a few that will change a little bit, and sometimes you'll add one down the road. And so periodically I'll have people retest, but I just don't have them, like, test every month because there's not that much of a shift as time goes on. Yeah, it's a pretty reliable test in that regard. The test is scored from a zero to four range, and zero means that you don't react to the food. One plus means it's a mild reaction. Two plus is stronger. Three plus is more severe. And four plus is a very severe reaction to that particular food. So we do have people especially look at the three plus and four plus foods, but two plus foods can also trigger pretty significant responses, and one plus on occasion can trigger a response. And it's not just your reaction to food that's important, but also your digestion, what you eat and what you digest. And Dr. Creer might like to say a few words about some of the digestion points, the enzymes. We know there's an association between low stomach acid and arthritis. Part of that association, I think, comes down to maldigestion of protein. And when you don't digest your protein properly, the protein's not broken down into the small amino acids that normally it should be broken down into. And those small amino acids are what should normally be absorbed across your small intestine and into your bloodstream. The problem is if you have low stomach acid, you have a lot of large proteins that are sitting there in your stomach and eventually down into your intestines. It's a two-fold factor. When you don't have enough stomach acid, a lot of the times your stomach is the first line of defense against foreign invaders that come into your system from outside to in. The stomach acid can actually kill viruses, bacteria, funguses, things of that sort. If you're not making enough stomach acid, you may be more susceptible to those kinds of things. All of those things, the protein maldigestion, the foreign invaders, those can all set up 
a thing that Dr. Ron talked about earlier called leaky gut or intestinal inflammation. When you get a lot of inflammation in your gut, the thing that happens is normally you have tight junctions in your gut that shouldn't allow foods that are large to be absorbed across your gut and into the bloodstream. If you have inflammation in your intestines, the small intestine for sure, then those gaps become loose. So now things that normally shouldn't be absorbed across the small intestine can be absorbed. Those things get absorbed into your bloodstream and your immune cells notice that those things are in the bloodstream and oftentimes they think, well, those things shouldn't be here. They can form an immune attack to those things that are crossing the intestines and into your bloodstream and form immune complexes. And those immune complexes can travel to various regions. Often they travel to your joints. And when those immune complexes get set up in the basement membrane of your joints, again, your body can react to those in a negative way and set up inflammation in your joints. So something that seems far away, your gut, can be the cause of your joint problems. So that's why we like to, there's a test out here we do called the Heidelberg test where we actually measure the amount of acid that your stomach's producing. We also measure the emptying time of your stomach and see if that can be a cause. You know, there's so many things that can cause arthritis, but the, the GI system is just one of those things that a lot of people don't think about. And so it's, it's pretty important to check that out. Chapter 6 in my book is entitled uh, uh, Gut Joint Inflammation. And it's just exactly about what Dr. Greer mentioned. And I just want to let you know that this individual that I, that I do a case history of was like 65 years old. He was just ready to go into retirement and he developed rheumatoid arthritis. And he was to the point to where they were going to put him on methotrexate and he decided to come to the center to be evaluated. His cytotoxic test there, we test for 90 foods. He had over 50 foods that were reactive, which is a lot. Normally we see maybe 15 or 20 that people will have on that test. So I knew from that right there he had an inflamed intestinal lining. So we did a number of different things. We had him go off the foods that he was sensitive to. We had him use some glutamine and some, uh, some, some special whey protein to, which had an anti-inflammatory effect. And I also put him on some fish oil. And uh, it was, I think, his second visit back that I came into the room and I said, how are you doing? And he says, well, I'm well. And I said, okay, well, how are you really doing? You know, I thought he was joking with me. He says, no, the arthritis is completely gone. He was also on some vitamin C and a couple other things that his test showed. So, uh, and, and I have, uh, that was like several years ago and I called him up to kind of make sure I had all the details right for the case history and he's still well. So uh, he's an example of someone who was able to reduce the inflammation in the lining of their intestines, stop the leaky gut, and reduce the source of the irritant that's causing the joint inflammation. So it, you can use this very effectively to get control of a chronic illness. Dr. Creer, are vegetarians less prone to get arthritis since you mentioned the protein aspect? There does, well, the studies do show that I think, you know, the, the vegan the vegans do seem to have uh, less arthritis. Now, why that is, I, I, I can't say because you do need, your body does need to absorb minerals and it does need to have protein to make the, the hydrochloric acid. Um, possibly, you know, it's these vegetables are in a, you know, in a pure whole foods form and they're full of nutrients, minerals, and vitamins, all of those cofactors that help fight inflammation in your body. So that may, that may be one of the reasons why a veg vegetarian diet seems to be better. But the studies do show that vegetarians have less arthritis. We have a vegetarian lecture coming up, so stay tuned. I think uh, it's in a couple of weeks. Can you talk a little bit about uh, glucosamine and uh, chondritin and MSM and tell us uh, any of the other sides of it? Is there something else we should be taking with it or some things we should not take if we're using those? One thing about glucosamine is that there's a wide range of quality. And I know I'll use my mom's example. I suggested she take glucosamine for her knee pains or knee arthritis. And she called me up and said, well, it just didn't work for her. 
and we found out where she was getting it, and I sent her, or I had her get some from a, a, a little bit better quality brand, and I had her only get the glucosamine. The studies pretty much show that 85% of the benefit comes from the glucosamine as opposed to the chondroitin. The book that came out, the, the Cure for Arthritis, that author recommended a combination of both, and there are some people that, that seem to do better with both, but the chondroitin is really nothing other than chains of glucosamine that your, that your digestive system has to break down into just the individual glucosamine molecules. Now, the glucosamine uh, is a precursor to high hyaluronic acid. And so when you, the reason why this is important is that that's what your body uses to repair connective tissue. Uh, does anyone know what happens when you, when you cut off the leg of a salamander or the tail? It grows back because salamanders, it turns out, have the highest amount of hyaluronic acid in their bodies of any other creature. So they're very good at regenerating connective tissue. So glucosamine seems to have at least a partially regenerative effect. And they've, they've documented this by looking at the space between the, 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 the knee, in the knee, the space between the upper bone and the lower bone. That has been shown to improve a little bit when people are taking a good quality glucosamine. Any comment about MSM? Well, MSM to me is a very good source of sulfur. And I don't know how many of you have smelt burning hair or burning skin, but it doesn't smell very good because it's very, the keratin and the connective tissue is very rich in sulfur. And so uh, if you don't get enough sulfur in your diet, you won't hold together as well. And, and I found this out with my uh, son who was a big soccer stud and what his junior year he had a number of injuries and I had him start using MSM powder in his drinking water and he was able to overcome uh, those injuries and, and start being much less injury prone. So uh, MSM does help reduce pain and it will help reduce inflammation and promote healing. So I usually encourage most of my arthritis patients to look into a good quality form of glucosamine and then adequate amounts of the MSM. Oftentimes just taking one or two MSM capsules is just not enough. You may have to actually get the powder and work your dose up into your drinking water. It's probably the best way to do it. What does Rich mean on your Rich's sheet? MSM is just a brand. Uh, Mr. Rich uh, himself uh, was involved in a car wreck, had like 50% of his body with third degree burns and he, was found, he found that by using high doses of MSM he was able to uh, reverse the scar tissue in, in a number of the in a large percentage of these uh, burned areas. So, so that's one of the things that MSM does is, is that it helps with scar tissue. Also helps cut down on leaky gut. So it's another reason why I like to recommend MSM. Very often these nutrients work in many different ways. People think of we we we're so used to thinking in terms of medications that you take a medicine for a certain symptom. With nutrients, your nutrients are working in your digestive system, they're working in your joints, they're working in your, uh, in your brain. And so, so you, can, you can get multiple side benefits from nutrients. As opposed to side effects, nutrients tend to have side benefits. How about glutamine? L-glutamine is listed here, and, and the reason why it's important is that we're gonna come back to this leaky gut theme. Uh, your cells require glucose as their primary source of energy. All of your cells except for the cells that line your intestine. And those are called enterocytes. And the enterocytes require glutamine as their primary source of fuel. And that's why when you see someone who's in the hospital and sick and they're not eating very well, they become cachectic. You know, have you heard of that term? That's where they start to get real thin and they lose their muscle mass. Sometimes cancer patients, or there's a patient in the hospital of ours that developed very bad uh, colitis. He can't eat anything. His body is literally cannibalizing his muscle mass in order to keep his gut alive because you store most of your glutamine in your muscles. Uh, bodybuilders like to take glutamine because it's very good for helping build your muscles. But if you've got a leaky gut syndrome, L-glutamine is one of the best things you can take to heal the inflamed uh, cells that line your intestines. So we, we like to recommend that for, for people that we think have le leaky gut syndrome. 
We see a lot of disordered digestion here at the center, and one of the things that we often do to get people off on the right foot is actually introducing beneficial bacteria. Um, if you've been on antibiotics in the past or you've got uh, food sensitivities you don't know about, you can often have sort of a disordered uh, flora of microorganisms in your bowels. And you actually need certain bacteria, um, Lactobacillus acidophilus and Bifidobacterium bifidum are the two uh, primary essential ones, and those are in uh, probiotic products. You may have heard the term probiotic, and that's what it's talking about, is actually eating beneficial bacteria that are good for your gut flora. They, they found that rheumatoid arthritis patients have a higher amount of Klebsiella bacteria in their digestive system and one of the things that happens when you take friendly bacteria is that you kind of crowd out the weeds. I always think of friendly bacteria as grass seed and you're trying to lay down a, a nice thick lawn of healthy bacteria that crowds out any pathologic bacteria or yeast or fungus. That or crabgrass. Crabgrass <laughs> that's trying to grow there. Got crabs in your gut. <laughs> Uh, I have a friend, she's been to about three doctors, and she just looks like a walking bruise factory. She's just always got a bruise all over. And uh, the doctor said, well, this just happened, that's where your skin is. Do you think MSM would help her? MSM might be beneficial. The flavonoids in general are very good for people who have capillary fragility. Capillary fragility means that you, you bruise easy. And so the flavonoids can help that out. Uh, sometimes lysine and proline are beneficial because you need those two along with vitamin C in order to make collagen. So I've often, you know, I'll, I'll have people check, make sure they're getting enough vitamin C, uh, lysine, proline, and then uh, a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables in order to get the flavonoids into their diet. And the flavonoids are very good anti-inflammatory agents. If you look down here under phytonutrients, there's something called quercetin which is a flavonoid that <clears throat> is derived from onions and from apples. And, and I have found that to be a very effective for chronic inflammation, including inflammation of the in nasal tract, like with allergies. So, uh, so if you've got allergies, in, in all likelihood, other parts of your body are inflamed as well. Do you have any insight on gout, which is a form of arthritis? Gout is a buildup of uric acid and you, you're not able to metabolize it properly um, and so, so then it builds up in, in joints usually down towards gravity will pull it down into the great toe or into the knee and so uh, you, can, you can actually uh, get a diet low in purine, is that right? Mm -hmm. a, low, a low purine diet will help you reduce your tendency for gout and then there are uh, vitamin C uh, can help increase your kidney's excretion of uric acid, so oftentimes that can be beneficial. It may turn you into a vegetarian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you talk about turmeric? I'm going to give that to Dr. Creer. Yeah, turmeric. Uh, it, it does a pretty good job in inhibiting some of the, the pro-inflammatory enzymes. Uh, you do need to take it in, in somewhat of a higher dose. The problem is if you, do, if you do take it in a higher dose, you just want to watch for signs of stomach irritation I, I'm not sure, or uh, intestinal irritation, but usually that's, that's not an issue. But turmeric does inhibit some of the pro-inflammatory enzymes and uh, it also supports the liver and the liver is where you have to detoxify a lot of the, you know, pretty much everything that comes into your body. So if you do have a lot of food allergens or allergens in general, uh, liver support is, is beneficial. I think that's one of the ways it works well is by through its liver supportive actions and through its anti-inflammatory properties. Would you need a tablet or just put it on your food as a spice? Either way, probably to get, to get the recommended dosage, you're going to have to take it in a tablet form. But as a general rule of thumb, the more spices, you know, spices are very rich in antioxidants and we're finding out that the spices have anti-inflammatory properties. What is there, ginger is a very good anti-inflammatory spice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a number of them and so when you spice your food up, if, you're, if your stomach can handle it okay, you'll actually help reduce your uh, infl inflammatory levels. I just want to put a plug in for exercise when it comes to arthritis. Um, 
And, and there's a couple of things that actually have been proven helpful. When you do different forms of exercise, it helps to strengthen the muscles that support the joint. And in osteoarthritis, you actually get a benefit from um, the motion in exercise that sort of squeezes the joint to help to drive nutrients out of the fluids around the joint into the cartilage. So exercise is beneficial. You have to, of course, find the form of exercise that works for you depending on um, where you may have you know, the least comfort. And along with that, um, I'm look at or feel how you dry your mouth is right now. Because if your mouth is dry, that's probably how dry your joints are. And your synovial fluid is how the cartilage in your joints gets nutrition. So if you have a real dry joint, you're not getting adequate nutrients to your cartilage. So one of the simplest things you can do is make sure you get that eight glasses of water per day, or I even challenge people to get a two-quart pitcher of water at the, in the morning and make sure it's empty by the end of the day. Uh, Jan? Help me visualize what an inflamed joint looks like. I mean, I just see two bones coming together and maybe some cartilage there, but when you talk about an inflamed joint, what's happening? Is the cartilage gone or is it just rough like sandpaper now? What, what, is it, what, what does it look like? I don't mean to monopolize this, but in the book, there are five stages of inflammation. And the first stage is something triggers inflammation. And it can be an infection, it can be an irritant, it can be, uh, uh, it can be trauma. And so uh, if you've injured a joint, like my, my, my brother had his knee, he, he injured it badly in football and they had to do surgery on the knee. Well, he's got arthritis in his knee now, he's in his 40s, because uh, that was an injury that started a, a pro-inflammatory process going. So that's the trigger. And then the next thing is you have activation of the inflammatory system. This is the cytokines. And for those of you that have heard of C-reactive protein, which you can go to your doctor and have your C-reactive protein measured, that's a measure of nonspecific inflammation in your body. That's a cytokine. It's the body's cell signaling protein that kind of sounds the alarm and gets everything going. And unfortunately, it can be sounding it inappropriately, and so you have more inflammation than, than what you need. Then the next phase is the white blood cells move in. The cytokines tell the white blood cells where to go. Here's where the problem is. The white blood cells move in and their purpose is to engulf bacteria or invaders or foreign objects to kind of help clean up the area. Unfortunately, with chronic arthritis, they are being called in inappropriately, let's say with the food antigens, the foods that are getting, those food complexes that are getting stuck there. They'll keep calling in the white blood cells. The white blood cells release enzymes that contain various free radicals that would normally be good for you, but if you have an excessive amount, then they start to do damage to your tissues. Then that damage, once again, triggers more uh, cytokine formation, and now you get into a chronic inflammatory condition. And so the lining of the joint, the synovia, the synovial lining tends to get reddened and swollen and inflamed. With osteoarthritis, it's more the cartilage is just slowly eroded away. Most people with osteo don't have the hot red joints, but rheumatoid arthritis, they tend to be red, hot, and swollen because it's more of an, uh, almost like an acute inflammation. But those are the steps of inflammation. The fifth step is kind of a, supposed to be healing and scar formation, fibrosis, but in a chronic situation, it just is, it's just like scarring and, and uh, and, and, and an injury that just doesn't heal. In, in the case of osteoarthritis, did any of these therapies then re rebuild that cartilage? Well, the glucosamine, I think, is helpful at rebuilding the cartilage. MSM can be beneficial. But remember that cartilage is a living tissue. So really, all of the nutrients could be factors in this. And uh, the, one of the, our famous little sayings is the most important nutrient is the one you're lowest in. And so when you measure your levels, you can oftentimes find 
low levels that you didn't suspect, B6 or, or something that you wouldn't normally think of as a treatment for arthritis, can help you if that's what you're low in. One more question? Then we better. We're just getting warmed up, aren't we? Did you say that the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 was important, and what is that ratio? Well, specifically, there's something called the arachidonic acid, which is an omega-6 that's pro-inflammatory, and then there's the EPA, which is omega-3, that's anti-inflammatory. The, the, the average American ratio is 20 to 1. The ideal ratio should be around 4 to 1. I had a question on the C-reactive protein. Uh, some literature I've read seems to indicate that that may be a, a good predictor of heart disease. But uh, when you start talking to the doctors about having this done when you do your blood work, uh, they seem to be a little hesitant. I don't know whether it's a uh, lack of, of, of knowledge of what the reading should be or not, but what, what is a good reading? What should you be looking for in the CRP? No. Normally, it should be a, a two or less to be ideal, uh, but we're seeing a lot of people with sixes, eights, tens, and if you've got very much arthritis, now if you have a really high reading, you probably have an infection or an autoimmune disease. But, but if it's slightly elevated, then that can be that low-grade systemic inflammation that they're now associating with heart disease. Heart disease uh, generates inflammation in the arteries and that's what causes the plaque and some of the damaging uh, damage to the arteries to occur so but if, you, if you've done one you, sh you know it, it should be less than than two and maybe even lower than that to be ideal you have to make sure that you're getting the ultra sensitive or high sensitive CRP which will pick up the low levels of atherosclerosis as opposed to the regular CRP which will pick up all types of inflammation. If you got a real bad arthritis and you do a highly sensitive CRP, it's going to be elevated just because of the inflammation from those parts of the body. And this is pretty new information, and you'll find that a lot of doctors are slow to incorporate new information. They're, they're, they want to go with the tried and true stuff like cholesterol levels. But the research is actually showing better correlation in terms of risk of heart disease and the ultra-sensitive CRP. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Appreciate it. The preceding program was presented by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International and the Bright Spot for Health. Additional information, call 316-682-3100 or visit 3100 North Hillside in Wichita, Kansas. For a wonderful overview of the center, be sure and log in to our website, www.brightspot.org.